It's an honor to be here this morning. When you get in my age bracket, it's an honor to be anywhere. (laughs) Just delighted to be able to be here. Enjoy the presence of the Lord. Enjoy the worship, the fellowship of the body of Christ. What a what a great place. I Pastor Candace and Matt mentioned this morning the the twentieth celebration of CFTN. I I've been a part of it now of about 15 years, so I came five years late. Uh, it wasn't God's fault. He tried to get me to do something five years earlier. I didn't do it. When I finally did it, I said, God, why now? I'm old. Why am I doing this now? <laughs> he said, because you didn't do it when I told you to. <laughs> yeah. But here I am. Been one of the richest experiences of my life. I'm excited about the celebration. In fact, I'm glad you let us know. I had planned to be out of town on that weekend, but I changed those plans immediately. I wouldn't miss it for anything. So make your plans to be here. If you're watching online, get an airline reservation and get here. It's going to be worth it. You'll enjoy every moment of it. Celebrating a great, a great culture that has been uh, developed here. You don't see very many cross-cultural, cross-generational churches. That's an amazing thing. It's not easy to do, but God has done it here through Pastor Mike and Mary's leadership. Not just their leadership. I just want to give a shout out this morning to the work of Candace and Matt and the work they do here. You see a lot of the results of their work. You just don't see all of the effort that goes into it with the team around them to produce what is being produced. So love them. Thank God for them. My message today, title of my message is Thoughts Matter. What were you thinking? You ever ask yourself that? Or maybe you ask somebody else that. What were you thinking? Where did that behavior come from? In the Guide to Emotion and Mental Health Prevention Magazine, it states, it is estimated that 90% of all physical problems have psychological roots. Thoughts matter. Thoughts produce behaviors. We'll get further into that here in a moment. Our state of mind is often the key to the quality of our life. I want to talk about states of mind a little bit. What is a state of mind? First of all, you can have different states of mind in different places. We can have one state of mind when we're in church, and we can have another state of mind when we're on the way home from church. (laughs) Some of you got that. We can have a different state of mind when we're at work than we have when we're at home. I love going to the beach. I don't like being in the water. I don't particularly like being in the sand. I just like being close. Okay? I enjoy the water. I enjoy the weather. And I have a good state of mind when I'm at the beach. Don't you wish you could live at the beach? Or maybe you prefer the mountains. You have a different state of mind in the environment that you're in. Every state of mind, think about this, every state of mind has its own thoughts, its own attitudes. Every state of mind has its own bodily sensations. Talk more about that in a little bit. Every state of mind has its own memories and its own emotions, just to name a few of the characteristics of a state of mind. So we have these different state of minds. We feel one way in one place. We feel another way in another place. We have thoughts in one place. We have different thoughts when we're in another place. So we have different states of mind depending on our environment. Our state of mind dictates 
whether we are in turmoil or whether we're in a state of joy and pleasure. Our state of mind, if we're in turmoil, we have anxiety, we have fear, we have anger, we have bitterness, we have strife, among another, a, a number of another, other negative experiences. When we have a state of mind that indicate, indicates inner peace, to love, joy, and well-being, then peace, joy, love, and well-being are what naturally projected outward. Consequently, these positive states of mind bring us positive experiences. So our thoughts control our state of mind. Thoughts matter. The thoughts that you're entertaining, the thoughts that you're focused on, the thoughts that you're giving life to. So let's talk about where in the world do these thoughts come from? I want to give you a little physiology here before I get into the scriptural context of what I want to talk about uh, from the biblical perspective, but let me just give you a little physiology here. You have three levels of your brain. You have the executive level of your brain. That's where you do your thinking. That's where you solve problems. That's where you rationalize things. That's where you try to make sense out of things. I often say when you're trying to make sense out of irrational behavior, you're going to lose that battle. So we, but we try to make sense out of things. And we do that in our executive brain, creativity. It's our consciousness. We're aware of what's going on. We're aware of all our surroundings. We're aware of what we're thinking. Then we have the second level. This is our, where our limbic system is. Our limbic system is what dumps uh, chemistry into our body, whether it's adrenaline or cortisol or serotonin or dopamine, all of these different chemi- chemistries that, that dictate our state of mind. It's also the emotional center of the brain. This is the executive level, the mid-level Something in the mid-level is called the amygdala. I, every time I say that word, it makes me smile. First of all, that I'm able to pronounce it. Secondly, I just like saying it. It makes me feel like I'm speaking in tongues or something. But uh, the amygdala. What is the amygdala? The amygdala is a little almond-shaped place in your brain that is the library of every emotion, every experience that you have ever had is located in the amygdala. Now, it's small, but it contains a lot of information. Now, in the amygdala, I like to think about it like this, like it's a library. Think of a library. Everything that's been written, everything that's been said and done is stored in this library. And you got this little librarian whose job is to find the emotion from the past that fits what you're experiencing in the present. So the job there is to bring the past into the present. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Hang on to the amygdala. Don't let it get away. Okay. The third level of our brain is the instinctive level. This is called, by scientists, called the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain doesn't think. It just reacts instinctively. The reptilian brain doesn't have reasoning, but it has experiences. Think of it as something that absorbs whatever's going on in our environment, whatever's going on in the culture, is our reptilian brain. It's the first part of our brain that is developed in gestation while we're still in our mother's womb, while the brain is just starting to develop. It has no reasoning power. It has no emotional power at this point. It's just absorbing the environment. The instinctual brain absorbs It doesn't reason, it doesn't emote, it just absorbs what's going on in the environment. 
and it becomes reflective of our experience. For instance, when we're young, we may have been taught to shut off or close down our emotions. We may have been programmed to deny our feelings, to bury them. If your feelings were hurt or we didn't like something the way it was, such as abuse, we were taught to forget it, ignore it. It doesn't matter. Don't think about it. Be quiet and it might go away. So we're taught to shut down particularly the negative emotions that we've experienced in our life. We're taught to bury them, to submerge them, to repress them. And it's like if we think we repress them, that they go away. The problem is they don't. Just because we bury them doesn't mean they're dead. They're still alive in that instinctive part of our brain. Hang with me. So the feelings don't leave just because we buried them. Buried feelings, particularly negative ones, are the source of our unresolved internal conflicts. They're not forgotten. Your body remembers at what's called a cellular level, an instinctive level in our nervous system. It's where it all takes place. It's, it's stored there in that lower part of our reptilian brain. So it is, and the reptilian brain is always about survival. It's not about what's right or what's wrong. It's not about what's good or what's bad. It's about just trying to survive. So it's instinctive. It fights back. It runs. It flees. It, it fights, flees, or freezes. So buried negative feelings are the source of our destructive thoughts and are revealed in our self-talk. If you want to know where your thoughts are coming from, listen to your self-talk. It's revealed in our body language and often in our irritable moods. Why am I irritable? I don't know why I'm irritable today. I told my daughter the other day, talking or on the phone, I talk to my oldest daughter almost every day. And my other daughter, when she gets time off work, we spend time on the phone. I told her, I said, you know, I've just been in an irritable mood today. I feel sorry for the people that I was working with today because I was a little snappy at them. I get that way every once in a while. Why am I irritable? Why am I angry today? Why, what, what's going on? What's triggered me that I'm angry today? I'm irritable today or I'm anxious today or I'm, I'm depressed today or I'm despondent over life today. What's going on? Something in that, in that instinctive brain has been triggered. And so it produces a, what's called a bodily sensation. Now, bodily sensations are different than emotions. Here's what bodily sensations look like. I'll give you a few. Can't give you all of them. The list would be too many. But a bodily sensation is suddenly you start having heart palpitations. Your heart starts beating faster. Or you start breathing more shallow. Or you just have a pain in your back or a pain in your neck. And you tighten your jaw. And, and you feel rigid. Your whole body has become rigid. You're tense. You're ramped up. You're, you're agitated. Where's that coming from? You didn't just decide, oh, I'm going to be irritable. Thought that through. You just didn't decide, oh, I'm going to be depressed. I was thinking about that, and I just want to be depressed today. Or I was thinking about it, and I thought anxiety would be a good thing for me to have today. It's not like that we think to have those things, they're not coming from the top down, they're coming from the bottom up of our instinctive brain to our emotional. So we have this bodily sensation and it sends a message, this happens so quickly, but it sends a message then from the bottom of our brain, the reptilian brain, it sends a message to our emotional brain. Oh, 
I'm having this sensation, so I've got to have an emotion that attaches to it. So the little librarian runs up and down the aisles of our memory and finds that memory that is attached to this bodily sensation. Now, what happens then, I don't want to get too far off in the weeds here, but I'll go a little deeper. It enacts what's called the, the hypothalamus of our brain that releases adrenaline, cortisol, or other chemicals into our body. So if it's a negative thought, a negative trigger that triggers an emotional negative thing from the past, now it's dumping adrenaline and cortisol into our system and we are ramped up. We're ready to fight. We don't know who to fight, but we got to find somebody because I've got all this negative energy. And if I can't find somebody, I'll just kick the dog. I've just got to have, I've got to let somebody experience what I'm feeling here. And then the rational brain, the interesting thing here, the rational brain gets into, uh, gets into agreement with the emotional brain that gets into agreement with the with the instinctive brain, and now you are just on a mission. You don't know what the mission is, but you're going to find a place to put the mission. It might be your spouse. It might be your children. It might be your job. But somebody has got to bear all of this negative energy, and we think we have to put it somewhere. And our thoughts are just going 10,000 miles an hour. I knew you didn't love me. I knew I couldn't trust you. I knew life was out to defeat me. I knew, I knew, I knew. You see, the brain, here's something about your brain. If you don't know it, you need to know it. Your brain always wants to be right. Don't give me the facts. Just give me what agrees with how I'm feeling. See, feelings are strong, but they're not always accurate. Pastor Mike says it this way, your emotions are stupid. Because emotions are not thinking, emotions are just responding instinctively. They are just responding. We're bringing the past into the present. Unhealed wounds cause us to interpret the present by past experiences. That's the way it was then. That must be the way it is now. That's the way it was with that person. That must be the way it is with this person. That's the way it was in that situation. That's the way it must be in this situation. Unhealed wounds always bring the past into the present while healed wounds interpret the past from present revelation. See, when <laughs> you got to get this. When I understand that God understood, I, I was working with somebody just uh, a week or so ago who, who's so ramped up with past negative traumas that they're reacting it all out in the present. And, and, and they were saying, God could never love me. God, I, I'm just too ugly. I'm too emotional. I'm too negative. And I said, do you ever think that God might understand? Can I just tell you something this morning? God understands you. He understands when you make a promise that you don't know how to keep and you break the promise. He knows that you're coming against something that you have not allowed him to heal and you don't have the capability, the capacity to keep a promise. An addict will always tell you, I'll never take drugs again. Alcoholic will always say, I'll never do it again. An abusive spouse will always say, I will never do it again. It's not something they set out to do. Now, I'm not justifying it. I'm explaining it. It's not something they set out to do. It's something that just happens. I was working with one of, one of the coaches. My coaches called me not too long ago. 
about an experience she was having with her adult son. Her adult sons had a, had a drug abuse problem for a number of years. He's an addict. He has addictive behaviors, not his identity. It's his behavior. He has an addiction. And he, got, he was in uh, rehab. <laughs> he got arrested for having drugs smuggled into the rehab. Not something he thought about doing. It's something that he instinctively did. And she said, she said, I don't want to get him out of prison, but I don't want him to be in prison because if he gets out, I'm afraid he'll do it again. And I said, in his present state, that's exactly right because he has an addiction. He can make all the promises in the world, but until there's healing, it's a promise you can't keep. Can I just tell you, if you're making a promise that you can't keep, it's because you have a wound that you haven't allowed to be healed. (laughs) Nobody sets out. I can't imagine anybody setting out, I'm going to be addicted. I'm going to be an alcoholic. I'm going to be a sociopath. I'm going to be a psychopath. Nobody's, that, that's nobody's goal. Nobody sets out to be those things or do those things. It comes out of brokenness, out of woundedness that you cannot heal with your rational mind. You can't heal it. You might control it, for periods of time, but there's a difference between controlling and healing. There's a difference between conforming and transformation. Let me tell you, God's not in the business of helping you control. He's in the business of transforming you so that you are victorious in Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Give him a great big praise offering this morning. Every time I take a drink of water, I think of a worn-out joke that my wife told me to quit saying, so I'm not going to say it. (laughs) Just trying to keep the message from becoming dry. (laughs) We either take control of our thoughts or our thoughts take control of us. You got to get that. We either take control of our thoughts and transform them, or our thoughts take control of us. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. Anybody in, in, in a charismatic church knows this verse, but I'm reading it to you from the, from the message translation. The world is unprincipled. It's a dog-eat-dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. We never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for the demolishing the entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. Philosophies are simply a way of thinking and believing that has come to represent the way that we live our life. All of us, all of us have a philosophy for life. Now, it might be negative, it might be positive, but we have developed a way of thinking about the world, a way of thinking about ourselves, a philosophy. Smashing down warped philosophies tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. Love this next line. Fitting every loose, now notice these three dimensions. Every loose thought, executive brain, and emotion, midbrain, and impulse, instinctive brain, into the structure of the life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of of obedience into maturity. Here is the goal of Scripture, the work of salvation. 
is to bring us to maturity. It's to bring our emotions, our thoughts, and our impulses, the three levels of our brain, into the structure of a life shaped by Christ. How do I get my instinctive brain? How do I get my big brain? How do I get my executive brain? All going in the same direction to fit in to the work of, that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It's a, great, it's a great picture if you get it. So an impulse, that body sensation that occurs at a non-conscious level, we often refer to them as triggers. Trigger sends a message to our midbrain where the library of our emotional memories is stored. Every emotional memory we have ever experienced is stored in the amygdala, even from your mother's womb. Then the amygdala sends a message to our conscious brain as to what to think based on past experience. See, without healing, everything is related to our past experience. And we get stuck there. And we're interpreting the present out of the past. As I said earlier, when we have transformation, we interpret the past out of the present God-given revelation. So we don't see our past as something that controls us. We see what God has taken, that past experience, and turned it into something good. For all things work together for good. Now, some people mistranslate that verse and say everything is good. No, everything is not good good. I was in another country a number of years ago, and uh, my, I've been teaching in the daytime, preach, teaching in the daytime, preaching at night, similar to what Pastor Mike's doing right now in Hawaii. People think those are vacations. Those are not vacations. Watch my lips. Those are not vacations. They're work. <laughs> They might be in an in a, in a, in a exotic place, but it still work. And so my host asked me, he said, got a couple of people that would just like to have a conversation with you. We don't have access to people with your level of training, and we just like, to, would it be okay if you just met with a couple of people? I said, sure. It was my day of rest before starting the journey back home. I said, what? I don't have anything else to do anyway. Sure. When I got there, the couple of people were literally wrapped around the building. Twelve hours and three translators later, I went back to the house. But one of those people, and I just had a few minutes with these people, but one of the couples... One of the couples that came to me was a young couple who was so confused, so distraught. They had not been believers, but they had come to the church because of a tragedy that had happened in their lives. They had two small children, a, two, a two-year-old and a newborn, and the dad was out in the front yard playing with the two-year-old and tending to the newborn at the same time. And the newborn became cranky and needed a diaper change. So he was literally changing the diaper. The two-year-old ran out into the street and was hit by a truck and killed. Trying to make sense out of all of this, they went to the church to try to find help. Unfortunately, they were given some very bad direction. People started trying to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. So they told them, well, here's, here's one of the stupid things that was said. I'm sorry. I'm just telling it what it is. It was stupid. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you can't be stupid.
Here's what somebody said. God knew your little boy was going to grow up to be a bad man. So he took him while he was young. Here's what I said. Well, he missed a lot of kids. <laughs> a lot of them got through the screening. No, you can't take something bad and say it was good. Somebody else said to them, God knew that if he took your son, you would come to serve the Lord. Now, that makes me want to run to Jesus, that he would take my son to get me to come to him. See, don't try to make good things out of bad things. Let God take the bad things what that was meant to you for harm, as Joshua said, and turn it to good. It's not that he's making the bad good. He's just taking it, putting it into his mixer of love and great insight and wisdom and showing you, here's what I did with your past. If you'll just let it be healed, it will show you who I am in your present. God doesn't make not bad things good. He just takes bad things and turns the result into good so that we can give God glory for everything in our lives. Give him a great big praise offering this morning. Remember, we either take control of our thoughts or what? Thoughts take control of us. So how do we reverse this thing from bottom-up thinking to top-down thinking? Well, I want to give you some dimensions here. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians again in the King James Version, verse 3 through 6. For we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Let me give you this a translation based on the, what we're talking about today. We walk in the flesh, but you can't fix the flesh with the flesh. We walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You can't fix the broken flesh by the reasoning of your conscious mind. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Anybody got a stronghold you're ready to pull down? Anybody got a thought process you're ready to pull down? Anybody have attitudes that you're ready to change? For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down vain imaginations, and every high thing, philosophy, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want to give you a little tool. I want to show you how to take a thought captive. Okay? You ready for this? Might want to write it down. I don't think it's in the notes. Number one, is this thought true? Is it true right now? You might say, well, yes, in this circumstance it is. Second question, is this thought true 100% of the time? Well, it might not be true 100% of the time, but it's true in this moment for me. Third thing, if I didn't have to have this thought, how would I behave? Not that you didn't have the thought, but if I didn't have to have this thought, how would I behave? Take that thought into captivity. Let me give this to you in a powerful way. God loves me. Is this true? Well, it feels true right now. I'm in church. <laughs> I've been worshiping with Worship Nation. It feels true right now because I'm in a fellowship of believers. But when I'm out there, it doesn't always feel true. But let me ask the second question. God loves me, this thought. Is it true? 
Second question, is it true 100% of the time? <laughs> oh, yes. God loves us 100% of the time. If I believe that he loves me 100% of the time, how is that going to impact my behavior? You see, when we get the right thoughts, we get the right behavior. When we come to, the, to our thought processes from the perspective of the Word of God, we can turn things around. Okay, that's just one tool. I'll give you some more here in a moment. So let's look at the passage through the message translation again. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. Now, sometimes we interpret that as the world's warped philosophies. I'm asking you to internalize it to breaking down and smashing your own warped philosophies, that God can only love me when I'm good. God can only love me when I'm performing. God can only love me when I'm doing everything good. Let me tell you, you don't have enough goodness for God to love you. He loves you because he is love. Are you hearing me this morning? Smash that warped philosophy that God can't love me. I was reflecting the other day, just worshiping the Lord at home by myself, just magnifying the Lord. And the song came on, one of my favorite songs, Lord, you have been so good to me. All of my life, you have been so good to me. And I was just meditating on that song. And here's what came up in my spirit. God, you have been as good to me as I would allow you to be. God has been good to me. And let me tell you, in many ways, I'm living out exactly what Pastor Mike says from this p platform almost every Sunday. Almost all the time, he talks about this, that the end's going to be better than the beginning. The best is yet to come. Many ways in my life right now, even in the absence of, of, of my wife, her physical absence, life is better for me right now. I, I was sharing this with my daughter yesterday. You said, I've got more. I'm living more comfortably. I've, I, I've, there's many ways. There's so many things that, that are so good right now. But I'm telling you, God is being as good to you as your thought processes will allow him to be. God's goodness is not limited. It's our thought processes that are limited. What we allow ourselves to believe that God wants to do for us. If you will expand your thought processes, you will expand your experience in the Lord. I mentioned a while ago, and being at CFTN these past 15 years after 40 years of pastoral ministry has been some of the richest experiences of my life because, Joan, my thought processes have changed. I have made them bigger than they have ever been before in my life, breaking off the legalism, breaking off all of that stuff in the past and experiencing God from a new perspective. Thank God he's bigger than your thoughts. I got to hurry. I didn't get to finish in the 9 o'clock service, so I hope I have the physical capacity to finish in this one. If we're going to take a thought captive, if we're going to take those contradictory thoughts from the Word, we have to know where our thoughts are coming from. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, okay, where does the devil come in? He'll come in any door you let him in. That's where he comes in. If he doesn't have a door, he doesn't have access. But he will, he will take, hijack our negative past experiences and put thoughts into our minds that we would have never thought of. So yes, the enemy brings thoughts because we allow him to hijack our past experiences. How do we stop this? I've given you three definitions, three ways of our thought processes. I want to give you a fourth one. 1 Corinthians 2.16. The unspiritual self, just as it is by nature, can't receive 
the gifts of God's Spirit. There's no capacity for them. You know, intellectual people, people that are more prone to rationale, are always trying to make sense of what's going on in the Spirit. Let me just clue you in. You're not going to make sense of it in your, in your rational mind. I, Pastor Mary mentioned last week about the movie. It's an old movie. What about Bob? There's a psychologist, and, and Bob's his patient, and Bob shows up unexpectedly everywhere. I didn't have a Bob. I had a Pete. Pete showed up in places he did not need to show up. He was literally stalking me. I would turn around and there was Pete. Pete was a highly intellectual, very smart, highly intellectual person. And he would want to have hours of conversations with me about why things are the way they are in, in, in the kingdom and he would say, I don't understand this thing. I don't understand paying tithes. I don't, it doesn't make sense to my rational brain. No, because it's a spiritual concept. See, I don't know how I can. He said, maybe because I'm giving away 10%, I'm taking better care of the 90%. Maybe that's why it works. I said, nope. I just learned to give Pete short answers. The longer answer I gave him, the more he showed up, whether I wanted him to or not. He'd show up in restaurants where Sharon and I were. I don't know how he knew where we were eating. I was out mowing the yard one day. Pete shows up, steps out from behind a bush. <laughs> he said, I don't understand how praying for people gets them well. So I told him one day, I said, you know, Pete, when you come to the end of your intellectual rationalization, you're going to find God. One morning he called me. I took the call. <laughs> and I said, Pete, what's up? He said, you won't believe what happened to me last night. He said, I literally had to fall on my face and repent of all the stuff I've been trying to figure out and repent of the way that I've been treating you and drilling you like a sergeant. He said, I poured my heart out to Jesus. He said, I get it. It's not about me. It's all about him. Let me tell you, when you get out of your own way, you'll find out God has been there all of the time. Do you want to give him a praise offering? Go ahead. I love Romans 8 and 1. Pastor's been on Romans for a while. Here's what it says in the 8 and 1 in the Amplified Bible. There is therefore now no condemnation. Everybody say no condemnation. No judging guilty of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates. Everybody say dictates. The dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. It goes back to that little proverbial cartoon. You got an angel sitting on one shoulder and you got the devil sitting on the other. One's whispering one thing, the devil's whispering another. It always amazes me. It amuses me when people call me and tell me I need some help. Here's what the devil's been telling me. Do you know that if he's speaking, he's lying? <laughs> Somebody just recently said to me, God had Bless them financially. They're a blessing to a lot of other people. They're a blessing to the house of God here at CFTN. They're a blessing to people wherever they go. Financial blessings they pour out on all people. 
and God, he, he, wanted a, he wanted a new car. And it was, by some standards, my standard, it was an expensive car. But he wanted it, and he bought it. So then he said, the devil's been telling me all these lies, all these things about me buying this car, that I'm being too prideful, I'm being too this or being too that. I know this person very well, and I know that's not the case. I said, can I just remind you that if he's speaking, he's lying. If the enemy is whispering into your thoughts, he is lying to you. People stop me all the time right here in the aisles. Can you help me? The devil's saying this to me. Yeah, I can help you. Quit listening to him. That doesn't cost you anything. Pastor Judy and I, either one, will give you that advice for free. Just stop listening to the devil and start listening to the Spirit of God. You see, the devil will put thoughts in your mind, but well, the Holy Spirit will put thoughts in your mind. Which are you going to listen to? We tend to listen to the judgment rather than listening to the very Word of God that tells us that we are His sons and His daughters and that He loves us. Give Him another big praise offering while I get a drink. When you don't even know what to pray, you don't even know what to think, God's got you. God's got you. Romans 8, 26, 28. The moment we get tired of the waiting, waiting on the promise of God, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Ever felt guilty for not knowing what to pray? Or not even wanting to pray? Are not wanting to hear somebody quote you a cliche scripture at that moment. Doesn't matter. He does our praying. (laughs) He does our praying for us. Making prayer out of our wordless sigh. Everybody give me a sigh. Holy Spirit takes your sigh, turns it into a prayer. When you don't even know what to pray, the Holy Spirit knows what's behind the sigh. And he tells the Father what you're thinking, (laughs) what you're not even thinking. And he turns it into a prayer. And even our, our wordless sighs or aching groans, give me a groan. Some of you weren't even faking it. It was a real groan. He turns it into a prayer. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. I love this next line. He knows our pregnant condition. Can I just prophesy over you this morning? You are pregnant. Single ladies, don't let that scare you. Those of you that want no more children, don't let that scare you. But God, is pre- he knows what he wants to birth in you. Can I just tell you, there's something in every one of us today that God is wanting to birth, but we are thwarting the pain by our thoughts that God can't do that for me. God certainly couldn't work that out for me. I I just tell people, start believing he can, and things will change. If you want to change your state of mind, change your thoughts. Your thoughts control your state of mind. So he said, that's why we can, he knows our pregnant condition and keeps us present before God. Everybody say present. Here's a powerful tool. Quit living in the past and live in the present. Quit living in the fear of the future and live in the present. What's right now? Oh, I'm worried I won't be able to pay my bill tomorrow. I'm worried I won't have food tomorrow. How you doing right now? How you doing right now? How are you doing right now? 
somebody I'm working with, they're not from CFTN, you wouldn't know this person, who just is experiencing anxiety. They, they had COVID last year. His wife was in the ICU. He was in the hospital for several weeks recovering from COVID. They're totally recovered, totally healed, gone back about their life, living their life, owns his own business, running his business, very, very, uh, very prosperous in his business. But he said, I've got this anxiety going on inside of me. He said, and I helped him understand it's instinctual. He said, if I sneeze, if I hear somebody sneeze, I think I'm going to catch COVID. If I hear somebody cough, I'm pretty sure I've caught COVID. He said, it's just in me. See, it's in his instinct. It's not something he's thinking. It's something that is, is directing his thoughts. So emotionally, he gets anxious, gets nervous about it, shuts him down, shuts down his operational systems. And maybe sometime in the future, I'll get into what that, what that means. But shuts down his operational systems, and he's frozen. He can't move. He can't go forward. So I ask him, how are you right now? Well, I'm fine right now. Well, thank God that you got healed from the past. But right now, I'm taken care of. Right now, in the present, I'm okay. Right here, right now, you are safe in the presence of God. He is with you. He is around you. He has surrounded you. So let's not look at what might be in the future or what has been in the past. Let's accept what God is doing for us in the moment, right here, right now, for the glory of Almighty God. i got to hurry. 1 Corinthians 14. One through three, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it. Nobody preaches that better than Pastor Mike. Give yourself to the gifts God gives you. Most of all, try to proclaim his truth. If you praise him in your private language of tongues, if you want to change your thoughts, start praying in tongues. Start using the gift of the Holy Spirit. Start praying in your, in your heavenly language, and it'll change your thought processes. God understands you no one else, when no one else does, for you are sharing intimacies between yourself, you, and Him. When you proclaim His truth in everyday speech, you're letting others in on the truth. Change your mind. Change your thoughts, change your state of mind. Change your thoughts, change your state of mind. We know we have the mind of Christ or the spirit of Christ when we fulfill Paul's challenge in Philippians chapter 4. I'll tell you how to change your spouse. You're upset with your spouse? Change your thoughts about your spouse. Lousy, no good, never follows through. To whatsoever things are good. What are the good things? Hate your job? Start thinking about the good things. Quit cursing the job you have. You won't ever get the job you want if you're cursing the job you have. Don't curse the season you're in. You'll never get out of it to the season God's ready to birth in you. Quit cursing where you are and embrace the love of God. Thinking on whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Quit looking at the bad. Start looking for the good and you'll change your state of mind. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard as seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, 
gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Let me tell you, you can change your state of mind by changing your thoughts. Would you stand with me? Prayer partners, would you come forward? We're going to tear down some strongholds this morning. We're going to break through some barriers. We sing about it. We worship to it. But we can't break through until we take charge of our thoughts and let God give us his thoughts so that we can experience the power and the presence of God. Like my friend Pete, you won't make sense out of it as long as you're trying to figure it out in your rational mind. But when your spirit connects with his spirit and we have communion of spirit, then we start understanding and receiving the things of God. If you're making promises that you can't keep, I got a word for you today. God's ready to heal you. He understands what's going on in you and he's ready to heal you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I just want to speak to this. If you're one of those people that you keep making a promise that you can't keep, I want you to recognize it's not a lack of intention. It's not even a matter of strong will. It's a matter of being healed. Letting God heal what's driving your behavior. We got people here that are ready to pray with you this morning if you need prayer and want God to break through. Here's what I prophesy, I speak, I predict. If you've internalized this message today, in the next few days, weeks to come, you're going to start seeing shackles fall off. You're going to start seeing wounds being healed. You're going to start looking at life through a different lens, a different perspective. And you're going to walk in victory and not in defeat. You're going to have hope and not despair. You're going to have joy and not sadness. You're going to have strength and not weakness. Let me tell you, God's ready to pull everything down that's keeping you from receiving everything God has for you. Can you just give him one more great big praise this morning? Oh, 